Before the doors of the public house at the corner, where the perfusion of gaslight reached the height of positive wickedness, a four-wheeled cab, standing by the curbstone, with no one on the box, seemed to cast out into the gutter on account of irremediable decay. Mrs. Verloc recognized the conveyance. Its, its aspect was so profoundly lamentable, with such a perfection of grotesque misery and weirdness of macabre detail, as if it were the cab of death itself, that Mrs. Verloc, with that ready compassion of a woman for a horse, when she is not sitting behind him, exclaimed vaguely, Poor brute! Hanging back suddenly, Stevie inflicted an arresting jerk upon his sister. Poor, poor, he ejaculated appreciatively. Cabman, poor too, he told me himself. The contemplation of the infirm and lonely steed overcame him. Jostled, but obstinate, he would remain there, trying to express the view, newly open to his sympathies, of the human and equine misery in close association. But it was very difficult. Poor brute, poor people, was all he could repeat. It did not seem forceful enough. And he came to a stop with an angry splutter. Shame. Stevie was no master of phrases, and perhaps for that very reason his thoughts lacked clearness and precision. But he felt with greater completeness and some profundity. That little word contained all his sense of indignation and horror at one sort of wretchedness having to feed upon the anguish of the other, at the poor cabman beating the poor horse in the name, as it were, of his poor kids at home. And Stevie knew what it was to be beaten. He knew it from experience. It was a bad world. Bad, bad. Mrs. Verloc, his only sister, guardian, and protector, could not pretend to such depths of insight. Moreover, she had not experienced the magic of the cabman's eloquence. She was in the dark as to the inwardness of the word shame. And she said placidly, Come along, Stevie, you can't help that. The docile Stevie went along, but now he went along without pride, shamblingly, and muttering half-words, and even words that would have been whole if they had not been made up of halves that did not belong to each other. It was as though he had been trying to fit all the words he could remember to his sentiments in order to get some sort of corresponding idea. And as a matter of fact, he got it at last. He hung back to utter it at once. Bad world for poor people. Directly he had expressed that thought, he became aware that it was familiar to him already in all its consequences. The circumstance strengthened his conviction immensely, but also augmented his indignation. Somebody, he felt, ought to be punished for it, punished with great severity. Being no skeptic but a moral creature, he was in a manner at the mercy of righteous passions. Beastly, he added concisely. It was clear to Mrs. Verloc that he was greatly excited. Nobody can help that, she said. Do come along. Is that the way you're taking care of me? Stevie mended his pace obediently. He prided himself on being a good brother. His morality, which was very complete, demanded that from him. Yet he was pained at the information imparted by his sister Winnie, who was good. Nobody could help that. He came along gloomily, but presently he brightened up like the rest of mankind, perplexed by the mystery of the universe. He had his moments of consoling trust in the organized powers of the earth. Police, he suggested confidently. The police aren't for that observed Mrs. Furlock cursorily, hurrying on her way. Stevie's face lengthened considerably. 
He was thinking. The more intense his thinking, the slacker was the droop of his lower jaw. And it was with an aspect of hopeless vacancy that he gave up his intellectual enterprise. Not for that, he mumbled, resigned but surprised. Not for that, he had formed for himself an ideal conception of the Metropolitan Police as a sort of benevolent institution for the suppression of evil. The notion of benevolence especially was very closely associated with his sense of the power of the men in blue. He had liked all police constables tenderly, with a guileless trustfulness, and he was pained. He was irritated, too, by a suspicion of duplicity and the members of the force. For Stevie was frank and as open as the day itself. What did they mean by pretending, then? Unlike his sister, who put her trust in face values, he wished to go to the bottom of the matter. He carried out his inquiry by means of an angry challenge. What are they for, then, when? What are they for? Tell me. Winnie disliked controversy, but fearing most a fit of black depression consequent on Stevie missing his mother very much at first, she did not altogether decline the discussion. Guiltless of all irony, she answered, yet in a form which was not perhaps unnatural in the wife of Mr. Verloc, delegate of the Central Red Committee, personal friend of certain anarchists, and a votary of social revolution. Don't you know what the police are for, Stevie? They are there so that them as have nothing should take anything away from them who have. She avoided using the verb to steal, because it always made her brother uncomfortable, for Stevie was delicately honest. Certain simple principles had been instilled into him so anxiously on account of his queerness that the mere names of certain transgressions filled him with horror. He had been always easily impressed by speeches. He was impressed and startled now, and his intelligence was very alert. What, he asked at once anxiously, not even if they were hungry, mustn't they? The two had paused in their walk. Not if they were ever so, said Mrs. Verloc, with an equanimity of a person untroubled by the problem of the distribution of wealth and exploring the perspective of the roadway for an omnibus of the right color. Certainly not. But what's the use of talking about all that? You aren't even hungry. She cast a swift glance at the boy like a young man by her side. She saw him amiable, attractive, affectionate, and only a little, a very little, peculiar. And she could not see him otherwise, for he was connected with what there was of the salt of passion in her tasteless life, the passion of indignation, of courage, of pity, and even of self-sacrifice. She did not add, and you aren't likely ever to be as long as I live. But she might very well have done so, since she had taken effectual steps to that end. Mr. Verloc was a very good husband. It was her honest impression that nobody could help liking the boy. She cried out suddenly, Quick, Stevie, stop that green bus. And Stevie, tremulous and important with his sister Winnie on his arm, flung up the other high above his head at the approaching bus with complete success. An hour afterwards, Mr. Verloc raised his eyes from a newspaper he was reading, or at any rate looking at, behind the counter, and in the expiring clatter of the doorbell beheld Winnie, his wife, enter and cross the shop on her way upstairs, followed by Stevie, his brother-in-law. The sight of his wife was agreeable to Mr. Verloc. It was his idiosyncrasy. The figure of his brother-in-law remained imperceptible to him, 
because of the morose thoughtfulness that lately had fallen like a veil between Mr. Verloc and the appearances of the world of sentences. He looked after his wife fixedly, without a word, as though she had been a phantom. His voice for home was husky and placid, but now it was not heard at all. It was not heard at supper, to which he called by his wife in the usual brief manner, Adolf. He sat down to consume it with conviction, wearing his hat pushed far back on his head. It was not devotion to an outdoor life, but the frequentation of foreign cafes which was responsible for that habit, investing with a character of unceremonious impertinency Mr. Verloc's steady fidelity to his own fireside. Twice, at the clatter of the cracked bell, he arose without a word, disappeared into the shop, and came back silently. During these absences, Mrs. Verloc, becoming acutely aware of the vacant place at her right hand, missed her mother very much, and stared stonily, while Stevie, from the same reason, kept on shuffling his feet, as though the floor under the table were uncomfortably hot. When Mr. Verloc returned to sit in his place like the very embodiment of silence, the character of Mrs. Verloc's stare underwent a subtle change, and Stevie ceased to fidget with his feet because of his great and awed regard for his sister's husband. He directed at him glances of respectful compassion. Mr. Verloc was sorry. His sister Winnie had impressed upon him in the omnibus that Mr. Verloc would be found at home in a state of sorrow and must not be worried. His father's anger, the irritability of gentlemen lodgers, and Mr. Verloc's predisposition to immoderate grief had been the main sanctions of Stevie's self-restraint. Of these sentiments, all easily provoked, but not always easy to understand, the last had the greatest moral efficiency, because Mr. Verloc was good. His mother and his sister had established that ethical fact on an unshakable foundation. They had established, erected, consecrated it behind Mr. Verloc's back for reasons that had nothing to do with abstract morality, and Mr. Verloc was not aware of it. It is but bare justice to him to say that he had no notion of appearing good to Stevie. Yet it, so it was. He was even the only man so qualified in Stevie's knowledge, because the gentleman lodgers had been too transient and too remote to have anything very distinct about them but perhaps their boots, and as regards the disciplinary measures of his father, the desolation of his mother and sister, from setting up a theory of goodness before the victim. It would have been too cruel, and it was even possible that Stevie would not have believed them. As far as Mr. Verloc was concerned, nothing could stand in the way of Stevie's belief. Mr. Verloc was obviously, yet mysteriously, good, and the grief of a good man is august. Stevie gave glances of reverential compassion to his brother-in-law. Mr. Verloc was sorry. The brother of Winnie had never before felt himself in such close communion with the mystery of that man's goodness. It was an understandable sorrow, and Stevie himself was sorry. He was very sorry, the same sort of sorrow, and his attention being drawn to this unpleasant state, Stevie shuffled his feet. His feelings were habitually manifested by the agitation of his limbs. Keep your feet quiet, dear, said Mrs. Verloc, with authority and tenderness. Then, turning toward her husband in an indifferent voice, the masterly achievement of instinctive tact. Are you going out tonight? she asked. The mere suggestion seemed repugnant to Mr. Verloc. He shook his head moodily, and then 
sat still with downcast eyes, looking at the piece of cheese on his plate for a whole minute. At the end of that time, he got up and went out, went right out into the clatter of the shop doorbell. He acted thus inconsistently, not from any desire to make himself unpleasant, but because of an unconquerable restlessness. It was no earthly good going out. He could not find anywhere in London what he wanted. But he went out. He led a cortege of dismal thoughts along dark streets, through lighted streets, in and out of two flash bars, as if in a half-hearted attempt to make a night of it, and finally back again to his menaced home, where he sat down fatigued behind the counter, and they crowded urgently round him like a pack of hungry black hounds. After locking up the house and putting out the gas, he took them upstairs with him, a dreadful escort for a man going to bed. His wife had preceded him some time before, and with all her ample form defined vaguely under the counterpane, her head on the pillow, and a hand under the cheek offered to his distraction the view of early drowsiness, arguing the possession of an equable soul. Her big eyes stared wide open, inert and dark, against the snowy whiteness of the linen. She did not move. She had an equable soul. She felt profoundly that things do not stand much looking into. She made her force and her wisdom of that instinct. But the taciturnity of Mr. Burlock had been lying heavily upon her for a good many days. It was a matter of fact, affecting her nerves, recumbent and motionless. She said placidly, You'll catch cold walking about in your socks like this. This speech, becoming the solicitude of the wife and the prudence of that woman, took Mr. Verloc unawares. He had left his boots downstairs, but he had forgotten to put on his slippers, and he had been turning about the bedroom on noiseless pads like a bear in a cage. At the sound of his wife's voice, he stopped and stared at her with a somnambulistic, expressionless gaze, so long that Mrs. Verloc moved her limbs slightly under the bedclothes. But she did not move her black head sunk in the white pillow, one hand under her cheek and the big, dark, unwinking eyes. Under her husband's expressionless stare, and remembering her mother's empty room across the landing, she felt an acute pang of loneliness. She had never been parted from her mother before. They had stood by each other. She felt that they had, and she said to herself that now mother was gone, gone for good. Mrs. Verloc had no illusions. Stevie remained, however, and she said, Mother's done what she wanted to do. There's no sense in it that I can see. I'm sure she couldn't have thought you had enough of her. It's perfectly wicked leaving us like that. Mr. Verloc was not a well-read person. His range of elusive phrases was limited, but there was a peculiar aptness in circumstances which made him think of rats leaving a doomed ship. He very nearly said so. He had grown suspicious and embittered. Could it be that the old woman had such an excellent nose? But the unreasonableness of such a suspicion was patent, and Mr. Verloc held his tongue. Not altogether, however. He muttered heavily, Perhaps it's just as well. He began to undress. Mrs. Verloc kept very still, perfectly still, with her eyes fixed in a dreamy, quiet stare, and her heart, for the fraction of a second, seemed to stand still, too. That night, she was not quite herself, as the saying is, and it was borne upon her with some force that a simple sentence may hold several diverse meanings, mostly disagreeable. How was it 
just as well. And why? But she did not allow herself to fall into the idleness of barren speculation. She was rather confirmed in her belief that things did not stand being looked into. Practical and subtle in her way, she brought Stevie to the front without loss of time, because in her the singleness of purpose had the unerring nature and the force of an instinct. What am I going to do to cheer up that boy for the first few days? I'm sure I don't know. He'll be worrying himself from morning till night before he gets used to mother being away. And he's such a good boy. I couldn't do without him. Mr. Verloc went on divesting himself of his clothes with the unnoticing inward concentration of a man undressing in the solitude of a vast and hopeless desert. For thus inhospitably did this fair earth, on common inheritance, present itself to the mental vision of Mr. Verloc. All was so still without and within that the lonely ticking of the clock on the landing stole into the room as if for the sake of company. Mr. Verloc, getting into the bed on his side, remained prone and mute behind Mrs. Verloc's back. His thick arms rested abandoned on the outside of the counterpane, like dropped weapons, like discarded tools. At that moment he was within a hair's breadth of making a clean breast of it all to his wife. The moment seemed propitious. Looking out of the corner of his eyes, he saw her ample shoulders draped in white, and the back of her head, with the hair done for the night, in three plates tied up with black tapes at the ends, and he forbore. Mr. Verloc loved his wife, as a wife should be loved, that is, maritally, with the regard one has for one's chief possession. This head arranged for the night, those ample shoulders, had an aspect of familiar sacredness, the sacredness of domestic peace. She moved not, massive and shapeless like a recumbent statue in the rough. He remembered her wide open eyes looking into the empty room. She was mysterious, with the mysteriousness of living beings. The far-famed secret agent, Delta, of the late Baron Stout Wartenheim's alarmist dispatches, was not the man to break into such mysteries. He was easily intimidated, and he was also indolent, with the indolence which is so often the secret of good nature. He forbore touching that mystery, out of love, timidity, and indolence, there would be always time enough. For several minutes he bore his suffering silently in the drowsy silence of the room, and then he disturbed it by a resolute declaration, I'm going on the continent tomorrow. His wife might have fallen asleep already, he could not tell. As a matter of fact, Mrs. Verloc had heard him. Her eyes remained very wide open, and she lay very still, confirmed in her instinctive conviction that things don't bear looking into very much. And yet it was nothing very unusual for Mr. Verloc to take such a trip. He renewed his stock from Paris and Brussels. Often he went over to make his purchases personally. A little select connection of amateurs was forming around the shop in Brett Street, a secret connection eminently proper for any business undertaken by Mr. Verloc, who, by a mystic accord of temperament and necessity, had been set apart to be a secret agent all his life. He waited for a while, then added, I'll be away for a week, or perhaps a fortnight. Get Mrs. Neal to come for the day. Mrs. Neal was the chairwoman of Brett Street, victim of her marriage with a debauched joiner. She was oppressed by the needs of many infant children 
red-armed and aproned in coarse sacking up to the armpits. She exhaled the anguish of the poor in a breath of soap suds and rum, in the uproar of scrubbing and the clatter of tin pails. Mrs. Verloc, full of deep purpose, spoke in the tone of the shallowest indifference. There is no need to have the woman here all day. I shall do very well with Stevie. She let the lonely clock on the landing count off fifteen ticks into the abyss of eternity, and asked, Shall I put the light out? Mr. Verloc snapped at his wife huskily, Put it out. 